everybody. We're the Good Doctors of Abbey Research. I'm Dr. Aaron. I'm Dr. Kristen. You are exceptionally welcome to our YouTube channel today. If you don't know, we're two doctors. That's why we call ourselves the Good Doctors. We have social science degrees that pair very nicely with our com uh, complete and total obsession with culture, popped and lived it, if it's got culture involved in it, which everything does, we will learn about it. We are obsessed nerds in a lot of different areas, and they all come together because we believe that curiosity can change the world because really it's the only thing that ever has. So we use our curiosity about cultures to help educate folks on empathy with the hopes that we can get to more inclusive societies and communities all around the world and here at home. We love talking to each other. We do it all the time. We turn on the recording devices so that we can talk with others and learn from you. So please make sure that you subscribe to the channel so you understand and get more information and updates from us when we're talking at you. Uh, but comment below with your thoughts and questions. We wanna hear from you and continue the conversation beyond this video. This video is part of our Colonizers World Tour series, which kicked off when we realized that only three countries in the entire world were never colonized by Europe. And the other thing that hadn't been is Antarctica, which has technically never been colonized by anyone because it's miserable. <laughs> um, and we were like, well, colonization seems like maybe it's a big deal. Colonized so by thought, penguins. It was colonized by penguins. It was colonized by penguins who are very benevolent overlords, those emperor penguins. So everything's good down in Antarctica. We figure there's probably a lot to learn about colonization. And when your country is taken over by one or two other countries throughout your history, and then a whole lot of people from other places move into your culture, your culture evolves. And so we wanted to talk about that. Therefore, we spend every month in a different colonizer group, colonize set, whatever. This chapter, we're talking about the Portuguese colonies. The first one we hung out with was the biggest one of all, the most famous, which is Brazil. Mm -hmm. And now we're heading to Angola, which I would like to inform you what Dr. Aaron and I knew about Angola before we started this week. And that is zero. We both yep. knew it was in Africa. Yep. And that's it. We didn't know it was a Portuguese colony. I knew it was in Southern Africa. I think Dr. Aaron did too. Like we knew it was towards the bottom. Nope. I had no idea where in Africa it was. I assumed because of the name Angola that it was French, which is just wrong. Well, also we don't understand the quite the etymology of Portuguese language. We're going to get into that. So it like, it, who knows? It could have been French at some point, but um, the not, name is not I actually. I learned about it. It's derived from a Portuguese word. But Portuguese could be like French. We don't, oh, yeah. don't I think understand. I see what you're saying. Portuguese could have French relations. Who knows? We didn't know anything, y'all. So this 101 is going to be fresh for you and fresh for us. Unless so let's go to the map. Let's go to the map. The geography, as we've established, it's in Southern Africa, Southwestern in particular on the Atlantic Ocean. It is between Namibia and the Democratic Republic. There's a province of uh, Kaminda, which is like the most important one because it's where 60% of the oil production is. And we'll get to this in a minute, but oil is the only thing it has going for it economically. So it is 33.6 million, million people living there, which when you think about kind of the, the, when you look at a map of Angola, like that's pretty big, but I would, but they all pretty much live in Luanda. Luanda, speaking of, is the capital. It is also the wealthiest capital on the planet. A average cost of a sandwich in Luanda is 26 US dollars because A, they import everything and B, there's a lot of nouveau riche with the oil money that drives up things. One of the favorite things that we learned, I'll just throw this in there, is that China has been um, investing in Angola for a long time and wanted to build an apartment complex for like all of its people and the, but it like only 10% of it is occupied because local Angolans can't afford it. Love it. So Portuguese is the official language, as we mentioned, and is a mysterious one to us. 71% of people speak it. Maybe they, they understand it better than we do. Maybe they know its origins. 
uh, ethnic and indigenous, it's divided between um, a couple different tribes, the Ombindu, the Kimbundu, and the Bakongo. And then there's a kind of mixed European and native African group of folks called Mestizo, which you'll hear in a lot of different cultures. The currency is the Kwanzaa, and uh, the economy is what one would call weak. It is 651 Kwanzaas to one US dollar. Um, Whenever there's that like one extra as a tourist, I'm always like, oh my God, just make it 650. I can't do this math in my head. But 651 as we record, the system of government is a presidential republic with 18 provinces. It's a civil legal system based on Portuguese civil law. And we'll get to it in a little bit, but the Portuguese ruled uh, Angola for 400 years. So they didn't achieve independence till 1975. And so of course, any form, and then immediately launched into a massive civil war. So there's not been a, t a really an opportunity to design anything that isn't based on Portuguese civil law. Let's keep our eyes peeled. They may go somewhere different from here on out. Now, because it's a Portuguese colony, you'll be shocked to hear that it is largely Roman Catholic. There is a good chunk of Protestants and there's some other folks, but really it's a pretty Catholic country. So in terms of the economy, let's go back to that really briefly. It's a really young country, which isn't surprising because it was a big, long civil war to get them to independence. Sorry, an independent war to get them to independence. And then a long ass civil war afterwards. And what we know from countries that are post violent conflict, it's a very young population because everybody else died or left as much as they could. So it's 17% unemployment though, for those really young country. So between the ages of 15 and 24 folks, 17% of them are unemployed. That's really massive for anybody who doesn't know international statistics, largely because the economy is entirely driven by the oil industry. And it's largely externally managed. The money does not really stay in Angola. And when it does stay in Angola, it is controlled by a very small percentage of Angolans. It does not go to the rest of Angola in any way, shape or form. Um, it is more than 70% of government revenue, the oil is, and 90% of the exports. 90%. At one point, they made a ton of coffee. Well, they don't make coffee anymore because they burned all the fields during the wars. So the infrastructure is all disrupted because of those two wars. The land is still disrupted because of those two wars. It's it's a big old mess because of those two wars. It has used billions of dollars in credit from China, Brazil, Portugal, Germany, and Spain to help rebuild the infrastructure. And then 2008 happened and they got kicked in the back again. There's just a lot happening that is very difficult for Angola. Also, this is not abnormal for freshly independent countries, but corruption is a way of life. And it is a long-term project for a lot of people. I would, there's, I'm sure there's families where their only business is corruption, kind of one of those things. And that's gonna continue to disrupt the economy and the infrastructure until it's rooted out, which it may or may never be because of the nature of, oh my God, it's 1975, like they're babies. Like that's not, it's really, really rough. Oh, Dr. Aaron, what else should we know? Oh boy. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it was fascinating to us as, as we learned more about Angola, the parallels to just timelines to the conflict in Northern Ireland, yeah. roughly the same time period of uh, what a lot of people in Northern Ireland would call a civil war. Um, it was certainly an, a violent armed conflict. Uh, and the so we know and we can infer a lot from the impact that that had on society and we see a lot of similarities and I don't doubt that a lot of demographic issues that are ha happening in Northern Ireland similarly in Angola. Uh, we know 40% of Angolans live below the poverty line so there really is this stark contrast between the nouveau riche in the oil sector and the really flashy parts of Luanda and everybody else who lives in Luanda and who doesn't um, below that poverty line. Only 70% of the population is literate, which might sound like a high number, but globally is actually very low. Very that, low. Is lo that is lower for women, which is often common. Um, and as Dr. Kristen said, it's a very young population. 45% are under the age of 15. 45% are under 15. Like just, you can think about that 
really easily and unpack a lot of what's going on. Uh, in their also, community. no, they don't hang out in school for very long. Like it's a, right. it's a short, so they're not hanging out in school, but then there's also no job. So oof. Yeah. Oof. The, the school life expectancy is 10 on average for boys and girls, a little bit higher for boys, a little bit lower for girls. Um, it's, a, it's a rough start for a country. It is a rough, rough start for a very young country. Half a million people were displaced during the 27 year civil war. Um, but most have uh, returned back since 2002. So that's a lot of people displacement and disruption. All of that factors in. We didn't do a deep dive into LGBTQIA life um, because we drew a lot of inferences and there wasn't a lot on Angola, to be frank. So if you have re resources on queer life in Angola, please let us know. What we did learn was that it was decriminalized in 2019, which was very recently. Um, you know, uh, civil wars aren't good for anybody, but they're definitely not good for marginalized groups. We know this. Um, we can draw a lot of conclusions from other areas that we've learned about Angola. But if we find more stuff, as always, we link our Google Doc living document um, in the show notes below. Uh, and as we update and find more resources on all these different things, we'll continue to add them to the Angola list. Now, colonization. Since this is the Colonizers World Tour, let's jump into that. Uh, what we now know as modern Angola was populated way, way back by nomadic Khoi and San peoples prior to Bantu migrations. Uh, Khoi and San peoples were displaced Bantus arriving in the area in the first millennium BCE, long, long time ago. There were a number of political entities. The best known was the Kingdom of the Congo, which was based in Angola, but extended into what is now the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the Republic of the Congo and Gabon. Portuguese explorer, here we go, Di Diogo Cao reached the area in 1484, after starting off relations with the Congo the year before. Uh, they wanted enslaved folks because as we learned when we did uh, Brazil 101, the Portuguese were real big in the slave trade. Um, big fans. Big fans of the slave trade. Uh, so they set up settlements all along what is now the Angolan coast. Control of Angola never really penetrated further than coastal ports and cities until the mid 19th century, which is interesting. A lot of stories of uh, colonizers going into and away from the coast and not surviving, either being killed by indigenous peoples or dying from disease. Slavery was abolished in Angola in 1836. And late in the late 19th century, the Portuguese colonizers started to face armed resistance from the Angolans that were like, you know what, we're kind of tired of this. Uh, first nationalist movements though started to form after World War II, which again, eerily similar to Northern Ireland. Um, there were periods of nationalist movements throughout in, in what is Ireland, but the, the big one again after World War II, spearheaded by largely westernized and Portuguese speaking urban class in Angola. In the 1960s, they were joined by other groups, and thus we started uh, the 14 war, 14 year war for independence after Portugal was like, we no to your calls for self determination. We would like to keep our colony. So between 1961 and 1975, three rival nationalist groups fought for popularity and control. After independence, two of those groups survived the MPLA and UNITA, which are acronyms, and fought for control from 1975 until 2002 during what we talked about as the Angolan Civil War. Eduardo dos Santos, Jose Eduardo dos Santos was the longest serving president from 1986 to 2017, was a very, fun. very corrupt dude, super, super corrupt. Fun. So was his daughter. He resigned in 2017 because of corruption. We also had a drought in 2016 that caused the worst food crisis in Southern Africa in 25 years. So 
really rocky start since the uh, end of the Civil War in 2002. Very unstable government structures. A lot of colonial legacy happening still uh, in modern Angola. I literally wrote still loads of problems in my notes, but that could be anywhere. Um, yeah. But spe specifically in Angola, um, I mean, none of it is surprising what happened after uh, the end of their colonial rule. Um, but boy, is it an unstable and interesting place with lots of conflict and lots of oil. Dr. Kristen, what is the thing you would like to talk about that you learned about Angola? Jeans are $240. Like, and that was from 2014. <laughs> that wasn't a recent YouTube video. No. Like, I can't imagine what it is now. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I was baffled by this incredibly rich oil producing country that we never talk about as part of like OPEC or anything else. China is like, China gets all their oil from Angola pretty much. Like they no longer get all of it from Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Okay. Like wild, wild to me, even just this whole process. And then discovering that there are, we, I, we couldn't find any videos that did not, that were not like predatory in ways, but there are entire tribes that exist outside of the Angola government structure and appear to be doing just fine. Yeah. But all of the resources we found about them, uh, treat, kind of, the lens was a little bit zoo animal or animal -y, So we're not sharing them because we, we don't love that. Yeah. But even the knowledge of the, that this culture is, these cultures of these tribal groups is perpetuating despite colonialization was, was encouraging to me. Yeah. And I think, again, we repeat our call for anybody finding this at any point in time with after it airs. Um, if you know Angola, if you love Angola, if you are Angolan and you have more resources, please help us out. Yep. We did furious searching on the interwebs. Um, and there wasn't, turns up so much. <laughs> there wasn't a lot. Although uh, we did learn about the Cuban intervention in- <laughs> Oh my gosh, that was wild. <laughs> which we have an animated documentary below. Oh boy, is it a fascinating place. Um, but I think for me, the, the most interesting and fascinating and fun thing that we learned was that there is a history of post-colonial satire Love as it. a method for political commentary in Angola. And so what, what that means, those were fancy words. What that means is we found the Angolan Daily Show. Yeah, we did. Uh, it is called Sopa Saber and it is hosted by Tiago Costa. Um, and you know, we didn't get into uh, Jose Eduardo Dos Santos rule at all, but there was a lot of media suppression. Um, anything that wasn't state, state sanctioned didn't get published or talked about. Uh, so there was a lot of silencing of journalists and especially ones that were going to criticize the government. So you had this birth of satire coming out and they literally, they, they tried to get a story released in the news um, Tiago Costa did and it, it, they wouldn't take it and so he went on YouTube and just filmed it and thus was born uh, Sopa Seber. Um, so he was very critical of Jose uh, Eduardo during the presidency and then continues to grow in popularity to this day. But please, please, please watch the link in the show notes from Al Jazeera English um, about both Tiago Costa and we meet a uh, Angolan uh, comic writer. Cartoonist. Cartoonist, thank you. Uh, and satirist. Um, and it's, it, they are actually hilarious. If I understood Portuguese, I would watch Sopo Saber. Um, so much. If it was, like, I'm tempted to discover if it's captioned because my favorite joke they told yes. was like, not to disparage clowns. They're doing a great job in parliament. Yeah. <laughs> I think he said it was like satirists aren't clowns or like comedians aren't clowns. <laughs> and I don't want to disparage clowns because they're doing a great job in government. I was like, hey, yo, um, humor is humor around the world. Um, but that's what I learned that I found really interesting. And I can't wait to dig more into Sopa Saber and other forms of angle and satire. Um, but I think that's our, I think that's what we've got on Angola 101. And where we're heading tomorrow with you, if you're joining us then, is an animated movie called Another Day of Life 
that is about the Angolan Civil War. It's hosted on Amazon Prime for here in the Americas. So if you're joining us live, we'll see you tomorrow. If you're in the times far after that, just hit next on the playlist and we'll see you for coverage of another day of life. Take care, everybody.